So today's Thursday, the 11th of August, 11 a.m. Eastern, uh, 4 p.m. London. We got an absolutely terrific room today. Uh, my friend uh, Edward Chancellor, who I'm sure is no stranger to anyone. Most of you are probably familiar with um, some of his past uh, works. He's become quite a uh, quite a tremendous author, among his many other talents. I have to say, for a subject which is as dry as finance and economics, um, one of the things that Ed does just as brilliantly is he makes it so come alive and so readable. I think even the layman can um, take pleasure in his works. Uh, his book, Devil Take the Hindmost, History of Financial Speculation, I think most of us have all read. And I believe this is his third third volume. Uh, Ed is uh, a friend. Uh, I think we suffer from uh, being geographically uh, uh, far apart. Otherwise, I, uh, I think I would know him better. Um, he's, um, again, uh, I've, I've gotten to know him. We know we have a lot of many of the same friends and it's always brilliant. I always learn something from, uh, talking to Ed. And so Ed has graciously, uh, agreed to come and speak to us, uh, his new book, the price of time. And we want to make this, uh, free flowing and interactive lively. I'm sure it will be. Uh, Edward, uh, I think, has 45 minutes. Uh, this room, I know it's out of character for me, but I'm going to put a hard stop on this room uh, at 12.15. It's going to be an hour and 15 minutes. So, Edward, welcome. Um, and I, I, I will note, uh, not to embarrass you, but um, I know you've reactivated your Twitter account on occasion of this space. Uh, don't be, it's okay, it's okay. Many of the others we've had come on don't even have a Twitter account. As a matter of fact, there have been one or two speakers who didn't even have a cell phone. So welcome, Ed. Very, very, Edward. Very, very good to see you today. You, you can hear me, George. We can hear you perfectly. Can you hear me all right? I, yeah, well, th thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm not sure if it's a good thing if you put me back on Twitter, as I've been um, studiously avoiding it for the last several years, but here I am. Are you, are you, uh, so you've come out of the sort of federal witness uh, protection program? Are you sort of hiding, as it were? Or are you just suspicious of Jack Dorsey and his minions? Yeah, I suppose I have this feeling that half the ills of this world originate in Twitter and the other half perhaps in the Federal Reserve. But <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we'll, we'll be mainly talking about the second half of those problems. Yeah, I would think so. So, Edward, um, the first thing, what I want to know is, I know you, your, your book is coming out. When is it hitting the, when is it hitting the bookstores? Yeah, I think sort of mid next week, sixteenth or yeah, sixteenth, I think. Excellent. So, um, no, that's fantastic. Edward was kind enough to forward me an advanced copy, which I actually read, believe it or not. And Edward, just so you know, um, this is a first for me. I've had two authors uh, now in, in in the course of a week. Our mutual friend uh, Vitaly Katzel Nelson, he was in last week, and I had to read his book, and now I've got to read your book. So it's forcing me to read, which. And, and tell me, you maybe you don't have this problem, but maybe you know of people who do have this problem. I'm finding my attention span, it's rather alarming, my attention span is starting to dwindle. And because we live in this 280 character world where everyone gets sucked in with sound bites and whatnot, um, the ability to concentrate, I just have to shut the door and block everything out. So do you resist that temptation or do you, do you know the feeling that I'm talking about, the problem that I'm speaking of? Yeah, well, it's one of the reasons I stay off Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, and it's also one, um, of the one of the reasons why you wouldn't know this, but my rooms can run on interminably, uh, and, and I believe in long form discussions. I hate sound bites, um, so unfortunately, I find myself falling victim to them. So, one question I want to ask you right up front, Edward: um, Have you uh, sent? Uh, I, I think your book needs to be read by every all by, by Jerome Powell and all the governors of the Federal Reserve, as well as the four hundred PhD economists of the Fed. Um, well, seriousness, have you sent this to uh, the Fed or to Jerome Powell, your book? Um, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, 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 I mean, first of all, I suppose we better tell the listeners what the book is about. It, yes, but yeah, yeah, yes, um, but yes, please. Well, why, why don't you have a go at that, please? So, well, it. I mean, the price of time, um, it might register with, with your listeners, but it, it might not. And, and that um, is is my definition among one of the many definitions of what interest is. And um, about 
six or seven years ago, uh, I was sitting down with a fund manager friend of mine in in London, and we we were chatting away. And I said, you know, twelve years ago, I was having this discussion with another hedge fund manager in London, and he said it's all about credit. So this is about sort of two thousand and three. Everything you need to know to understand the world is about credit, and that. At the time, I, I then sort of embarked on a report analyzing the credit system in the US and the UK, and then we published that as, as, sort of as, as a report called Crunch Time for Credit in 2005. So you fast forward 10 years, and we, I was sitting down and saying, well, it's all about interest now. You can't really understand either the financial world or what's going on in what people laughably called the real economy, um, without understanding the consequences of these extraordinary ultra-low interest rates. And that sort of set me on an intellectual journey that took me back to Mesopotamia in the third millennium BC, when we see uh, the first recording of interest rates right at the dawn of, of, of history of what we know of, of the record of man's activities. And um, so this book is an attempt both to, to, to describe the origins of, of interest, the, the way in which interest, although it was much criticized in the ancient world, and then in the medieval world, how it came to be established practice with the advent of of capitalism in the sort of late Middle Ages, early modern period, and how interest is the is the essence of the capitalist process. And the, the easiest way to describe that, I think, is that when we talk about something being when we talk about something as capital, what we're it's really a shorthand for the discounted future cash flows of some asset. And you see, without the discount rate or the capitalization rate, you can't have capital. And um, as the Austrian economist uh, Ludwig von Mises says in an aside, if an apple were, were, were if, if there was no discount rate, an apple in 200 years time would be worth the same as an apple today. And that is obviously absurd. Or as an earlier uh, economist and, and, and promoter, John Law, who I write about at length in the book, and I, I call him the, the, the progenitor of quantitative easing, when he, which is what he, uh, when John Law arrived in, in France in the, in the early 18th century, established a central bank, got rid of the gold-backed currency and instituted a paper currency, and then having instituted the paper currency, uh, proceeded to uh, double the money supply and use that money to buy shares in his Mississippi company, which increased 20-fold. Um, and John Law, for a brief time, was the richest man that ever lived until perhaps Elon Musk pipped him at the post quite recently. Um, and then it all fell to pieces. So that is the sort of historical context. And then uh, in the then the sort of second half of the book is really to look at what interest does in relating to the allocation of capital, the valuation of assets, the, the way in which it's an inducement to savings, and how interest is also a a gauge or measure of risk, or as one 18th century economist Fernando Galliani called it, the the, the price of anxiety, which is quite a nice uh, definition of, of, of interest, and how the very low interest rates of recent years have, have had, to my mind, a very sort of deleterious effect. Now, I think that, you know, up until 2014, I was working at GMO in Boston, and most of the people on this call would be uh, professional investors or at least interested in, investors. And... I think the, the views that I've sort of brought together, um, analyzing the problems 
caused by ultra low interest interest rates, whether they're the sort of the problems of zombification of companies, the contribution uh, that low rates have had to bringing down the productivity rate or, or, of the economies, the role that interest, the very low interest rates had in inflating the so-called everything bubble um, and creating what I would call a, a, a bubble economy. And, and this is why I earlier said that the sort of real economy was in inverted commas, because in fact, in a, we, we've created a very financialized economy in which the in which the finance sector and the real economy sort of interact with each, within each other. So you, some people refer to it as a sort of hyper real finance in which finance is, is sort of uh, no longer properly sort of representative of the real economy and various other factors like the carry trade flows and so forth. These will all, I think, be familiar to um, your listeners and extremely unfamiliar to most uh, inhabitants of the Eccles building in Washington, D.C., which is where the Federal Reserve has its headquarters. Ha having said that, I did send, I have asked publishers to send a copy to Kevin Walsh, who was one of the uh, members, a, a Fed governor for a while, who seems to have sort of turned, you know, with more practical uh, experience, financial experience, who worked for Morgan Stanley and I, I've asked the publishers to send him a copy. I asked, there's, a, there's a, a Harvard economist who was a brief Fed governor called Jeremy Stein. I don't know if you come across him. He, um, Jeremy Stein made an interesting comment in 2002, uh, and a, a, a talk he gave when he was at the Fed, uh, in which he pointed out uh, that, that all the sort of excessive risk-taking uh, that we, we'd, we'd seen in the run-up to the global financial crisis, um, particularly in the sort of uh, related, you know, the leverage buyout world, whether it's leverage loans or, or payment in kind bonds and so forth, how those measures had 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 all rebounded very quickly after what was meant to be the worst you know, financial downturn since the, the the Great Depression. And Jeremy Stein had this very perceptive comment uh, that it's all very well to try regulating. The financial markets, but it's only uh, monetary policy or what we would call interest rates that gets into all the cracks. And so this book really is a sort of examination of the various cracks, uh, both in the US and Europe, in China and in emerging markets, the cracks that this ultra low interest rates have sort of entered uh, and, and the problems that, that have been caused uh, thereby. That's terrific, Edward. Um, if you would just allow me to read for a minute uh, from your book, I'm actually going to actually read the whole book, but uh, I thought the introduction was terrific. And I want to read a few passages uh, of your writings to our listeners. Um, I chuckle when I read this, and you'll correct me for the mispronunciations and, and misstatements, but I thought uh, the introduction was absolutely fantastic. So allow me, I'm just going to excerpt here. This will just go on for a minute or so. At the very beginning, in 1849, a debate took place in the pages of La Voix du Peuple, a socialist publication between two members of the French National Assembly. On one side stood Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, Proudhon, the self-proclaimed anarchist, best known today for his motto, property is theft. On the other side was Frederick Bastiat, a free trade advocate. Um, Bastiat made his case against unproductive state interventions, for instance, with his petition of the candle makers, in which candle makers request a law requiring people to close their blinds and shutters against the sun in order that more candles could be sold. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of our craziness is going on today. Um, the subject of discussion was the legitimacy of interest. Proud of took an old fashioned view, yada, yada, yada. Here we go. Um, so uh, he goes on to say, Interest fuels class antagonism and restricts consumption by raising the price of products. Hmm. Um, in a capitalist society, says Pardon, workers cannot afford to acquire the objects they produce with their own hands. Interest is like a double-edged sword. It kills whichever side um, it hits you with. There was nothing original in his invective. 
Um, his rhetoric was high flown and repetitive, and his economic analysis was not profound. In his history of economic analysis, Joseph Schumpeter lamented Proudhon's complete inability to analyze. Even so, Proudhon had some original proposals. Here we go. Maybe Jerome Powell did read your book. He wanted to nationalize the Bank de France, expand the money supply, and reduce interest rates close to zero. His people's bank would charge half a percent to cover its costs. Gold would be replaced by paper money. Gee, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, in addition, he demanded a tax on capital, tantamount to negative interest rates. The reduction in interest he envisaged would instantly produce incalculable results all over the Republic and across Europe. There would be no more debt, insolvencies and bankruptcies would decline, consumption would increase, and labor would be guaranteed unemployment. Once interest rose was no longer taken by the parasitic class of lenders, worker incomes would rise. And then I'm just going to fast forward and I'll stop. Um, here you go on to some of Bastiat's response. Bastiat foresaw disaster if Proudhon's plans were put into practice. If lending were not rewarded, there'd be no lending. Uh, to restrict payments on capital would be to abolish capital. Savings would disappear. Proudhon's national bank would lend. But if the bank demanded security for its loans to working people lacking security, they would be no better off. The abolition of interest would only benefit the wealthy. In your system, Bastiat wrote to Paradon, the rich will indeed borrow gratis, while the poor will not be able to borrow at any price. When a rich man presents himself at the bank, he will be told, you are solvent, here is the capital, we will lend it to you for nothing. But let a worker dare to show his face, he will be asked, where are your guarantees, your lands, your houses, your goods? I have only my arms and my probity, the worker replies. That does not reassure us. We must act with prudence and severity. We cannot lend you gratis. And then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just conclude. Um, you have a great quote here um, um, uh, from, from Bastiat um, here. Free credit is socialism's final word, its final slogan, and its final effort. Edward, uh, it would seem that the more things change, the more they stay, in, stay the same. There's nothing new under the sun. Well, there aren't that many new ideas. I mean, fortunately, Proudhon's plan wasn't actually put into practice then. Um, what I argue is that the, uh, the, the central bankers after 2008 were this sort of unwitting, they were sort of unwitting, I mentioned earlier John Law, they were sort of the unwitting disciples of John Law, but they were also the unwitting disciples of Proudhon. And that comment uh, that Bastia makes, that the, the working man would be no better off, uh, was quite borne out uh, by the events of the last 13 years or so. Um, as, as, as you're probably aware, uh, after the financial crisis, uh, Fed funds rate dropped close to zero. Those who had the, the highest credit standing on Wall Street, particularly private equity firms, uh, were able to borrow extremely cheaply and to lever up at financial assets with a higher return uh, that allowed them to make massive fortunes. But if you were at the other end of the se social spectrum, the, the much maligned uh, subprime spectrum, you, you ended up paying um, higher interest rates than before the global financial crisis. And I think the, the credit card charges uh, at APRs at 25% a year uh, didn't change at all. So in that sense, I, I mean, I think Bastia got it quite right. And he, I, I think he also got it right when he says it's that the, the sort of zero interest rates are a sort of clarion call for socialism, because my argument throughout the book and is that capitalism cannot function at a zero interest rate. It loses its, the, the system loses its capacity to, um, to coordinate, to, for, for what we call you know, intertemporal coordination to, to balance savings and investment uh, and debt and consumption across time. And the conclusion of my book um, is, is really drawn from uh, Friedrich Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, and it's called you know, the, the Road to Serfdom Revisited, uh, or The New Road to Serfdom, I think. And it's pointing out that if you have, if you maintain zero rates, you will then have to have uh, uh, the, the state will have to take a larger and larger role. And in fact, one of the things we saw over the last decade was the central banks themselves uh, moving from pure quantitative easing of buying 
you know, treasury bonds to getting in around the world, to getting into credit policies and buying equities and involving themselves in social, in corporate governance, and then more lately in sort of green investment policies and so forth. So you see this sort of creeping extension of the central banks uh, and, you know, then in, into the sort of COVID lockdowns, sort of modern, you know, a brief sort of um, a brief moment for for modern monetary theory and you know the ma magic money tree in which the state suddenly you know tells everyone to stay at home and lavishes money on <laughs> on everyone, uh, expecting uh, you know a sort of nirvana, sort of Proudhon's nirvana, which uh, you know whose consequences we're now living through. Right. So staying again, and I want to stay with the intro uh, just because I'm I, I better. I speak less. So I'll just put the questions to you. Um, there are two other concepts here early on in your introduction, which I think are really resonated with me. And you kind of delved into it much more did a deeper dive. So um, again, we come back to um, Bastiat, um, where the, the notion of what is seen and what is not seen. All right. Um, and, I'll just excerpt here just a couple sentences here. Um, Bastiat, um, you know, rather than focusing on the short-term impact of any action, is urging readers, and I'm paraphrasing here, urging readers to consider the broad consequences of any economic action, not just its effect on a particular beneficiary. Um, and so, um, and then he goes on to say, the entire difference between a bad and a good economist is apparent here. A bad one relies on the visible effect while the good one takes into account of both the effect one can see and that one and, and those that one must foresee. So, you know, the idea of are you pursuing a small current benefit to be followed by a large disadvantage in the future, which is something politicians, you know, um, <laughs> they, they don't have a problem with that. So uh, and then you go on to reference uh, Henry Hazlitt in this regard. So maybe this idea of um, of. Um, what you see and what you don't see and short-term gain, long-term pain. Again, that seems extremely relevant to what's going on right, right now. No, it just seems though that there's like an infinite ability to kick the can down the road. Yes. So, well, yeah. I mean, George, so I think um, Jim Grant was once asked you know, what he would do if he uh, was made um, chairman of the federal reserve. And he said he, first thing he'd do was set up an office of unintended consequences. Um, and really when, when I started this, project um the 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 paper that sort of got me going was a paper by bill white uh, former chief economist of the bank for international settlements one of the few sort of establishment economists who who dared sort of um you know who dared um criticize the federal reserve and central bank policies uh, both before the financial crisis and afterwards. And Bill White wrote a paper in 2012 called The Unintended Consequences of Ultra-Easy Money. And in that paper and in the book, I elaborate at greater length um, these unintended consequences, some which I you know, mentioned earlier, the, the, you know, the zombification of the economies, the financialization of, of, um, of the in further financialization of the economy, the build up in, in debt. Uh, and one of the things, you know, go back to the Bastia point, the, 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 the extent to which inequality that people profess to be so concerned about nowadays, to a large extent, is, um, is, is a consequence of the asset price inflation and financialization that we've witnessed, both before and after the financial crisis. Um, and you can see, and, and in a way that that's pretty obvious to any of us who've worked in in the investment world or in finance in general, is that you know, whether we like it or not, uh, our pay at the end of the year is linked to our, the firm's assets under management, or if you're uh, if if you're an investment banker, to the number of deals that are done, and asset under management and 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 deals uh, to some extent a function of the monetary conditions. So you know, and and furthermore, you know the those who have assets to begin with, whether they're whether they're investment assets or real estate, will will find that the that the valuation of those assets are, are inflated. Whereas those who don't have assets, um, starting off in in life, uh, find it much harder to you know get a, a foot on the housing ladder or to accumulate assets going forward. So 
And I, so what I, I sort of cheekily put it in my chapter on, on inequality is that um, you know, Thomas Piketty became famous for his, um, you know, for his thesis uh, that inequality rose when R was greater than G. Um, and R, in his notation, is, is the rate of return and G being the growth rate of the economy. And I say, you know, Piketty's um, uh, equation is, is interesting, but he got, uh, he got the notation the wrong way around. Uh, the inequality rises when R, the rate of interest, is below G. And that's not just a finding of the, you know, of recent, you know, was well, not just my finding of recent years, but you can also see that was the case in the 1920s, where uh, in, in, in nominal terms and real terms, U.S. interest rates were not uh, low or particularly low, but they were very low considering the sort of productivity explosion that the U.S. experienced in the 1920s. And that was also, as everyone knows, a period of, you know, of, of um a, a rising inequality of um, I can't remember the Scott Fitzgerald says that everyone uh, I can't Scott Fitzgerald refers to people uh, having the, the 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 profligacy of grand dukes and the uh, and the insouciance of cool girls or something to that effect. But then if you go back even earlier to the late nineteenth century, the sort of era of the Gilded Age, again you see this uh, relationship between you know these great you know the the fortunes of the robber barons, many of which were put together. Uh, you know, came from uh, J.P. Morgan creating these massive trusts. Uh, again, we 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 put together with with cheap with cheap money. And one of the definitions of interest uh, that I came across in the in the course of this work was, it interest is the cost of corporate control. Now, you think about it. You know, the last few decades we've seen the you know the rise of the private equity barons and with the cost of corporate control falling to very low levels indeed it's not surprising that those who who accessed the uh the wall street the financial markets to acquire companies whether leverage buyouts or whether these were companies that are making uh, themselves debt fueled acquisitions that they uh, that they benefited um, really at the expense of the man on the street. So, Edward, um, let's get on to a few other points. And I'd like, we have some really sharp uh, uh, individuals in the room, and I, I want to open this up and, and get, get a more free flowing discussion. Um, so, given where we are right now and looking at the trajectory of um, these past uh, misadventures, um, what does history suggest as to the way forward from here? Is, um, you know, an implosion of an asset bubble inevitable? Will we see inflation? Like, what can we learn from history, uh, Edward? Um, well, I mean, for a start, I'd say we've never really been in a situation quite like this before. Um, you know, what, what we've seen, uh, you know, it, it, let's take the U.S. What we've seen in the U.S. Are, over the past 25 years is a succession of asset price or wealth bubbles, if you want to call them that, you know, and which we which when you and I have lived through you know, the the dot com bubble, the sort of US real estate and credit bubble, and then, so to speak, the everything bubble. And uh, one way of you know gauging this uh, from, you know, from the you know, the impact of this on household balance sheets is looking at the Fed's uh, household wealth survey. Survey, And what you see is at each successive bubble, household wealth has climbed to higher and higher levels. So the, the household wealth you know, prior to the GFC was bigger than in 2000. And at the end of last year, household wealth was greater uh, than at any time in history. And what's interesting is that this household wealth was growing at a time when actually investment uh, in the economy, uh, actual investment, was declining. So I argue that it's a type of bubble wealth or virtual wealth uh, that, you know, that can't be maintained or sustained over time. 
Now, what what has sustained it, the the, the great the, the triple wealth bubble, has been ever lower rates of interest and throw in quantitative easing, if you want, and, and other sort of unconventional monetary policies. And that was all well and good, providing inflation, inflation expectations, so forth, remained under control. They could, you know, and people, you know, you mentioned kicking the can, or, you know, people used to talk about the sort of Fed running out of bullets. And you know, those of us who've been sort of you know, following this succession of bubbles was always sort of wondering, you know, when when it was all going to end. And I think it became pretty clear a while back that it would only end when inflation became, uh, you know, uh, uncontrolled or unleashed. Uh, one of the, you know, one of the economists I, I used to, I speak to um, a guy called Tim Lee, English guy, used um, he, he said, he, he talked about uh, the post, the post, the inflation period or the quiescent inflation after the global global financial crisis. He said it. It he compared it to a sort of a ketchup, a, tom, a Heinz tomato ketchup um, bottle in a diner that had been sort of desiccated for a while, and the the central bankers were busy, busy sort of hitting on the the bot the bottom of the ketchup, and nothing was coming out until eventually. It was going to sort of splurge, splurge out, and cover the chips and the burger, and we're sort of in the at that we sort of reached that phase now, and that me and one consequence of that is that for the time being, the 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 Federal Reserve, monetary authorities, whether in in in, in the U.S. or or Europe or U.K., they they're not able to uh, devote all their efforts. To maintain, you know, to to keeping to maintaining asset prices at highly elevated levels and to dampening volatility, which is you know, two of the things that they uh, have proved masterful at over the last decade. Yeah, Edward, on that last point, if we go to later on in your book, you have in part two, you have a part about entitled "How Low Rates Begot Low Rates," and then um, you speak of Goodhart's law. Uh, which I wasn't completely familiar with before I read this book. Um, and you you co-quote here, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become um, a good measure. And then you take a quote from uh, former Bank of England Governor Mervyn King, we have not targeted those things which we ought to have targeted. This is from 2016. We have targeted those things which we ought not to have targeted, and there's no health in the economy. So could you just explain a little bit about Goodhart's Law for, for myself and for those of us in the room? Well, when I, I, I was studying economics at school in the early 1980s and and I think we had a paper on you know, treasury paper on um, how to control inflation uh, and it was all about uh, you know money supply aggregates and how to how to bring those money supply aggregates under control by jacking up interest rates and what Goodhart uh, noticed somewhat earlier is that whenever the central bank has targeted one measure of the interest or of the money supply, which they believed link was correlated with inflation, the correlation would break down. And um, I, what I argue uh, is that the pursuit of inflation targeting of this 2% uh, inflation target that became pretty much uh, universal in the developed world over, over the last it was started in, 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 in New Zealand, actually, in, in the early 1990s and then became progressively adopted most recently by the U.S. under Bernanke and then by Japan, that the inflation target uh, it itself was um, h highly corrupt, corrosive. And in particular, going back, because it, uh, it, it was corrosive for a variety of reasons. First of all, because they, there was exaggerated... Um, concern about uh, about deflation. In fact, there was a failure to distinguish between the the debt deflation that follows from a sort of credit bust, like we saw in two thousand eight, from the sort of benign deflation that comes from positive supply shocks, which we experienced after you know China, you know, the opening up of the global economy after the collapse of 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 communism and with various technological improvements. So they if you will, the central bankers, by focusing on the 
on this target they they forgot about all the things that were were not in sight were not uh, um, encapsulated by that target and um, and you know thereafter a number of bad things started to follow and I take heart that you know I saw that two weeks ago one of the former uh, governors of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand uh, came up were, you know, just put out a, a brief paper making very much the points I've just discussed that that the inflation target that the central bankers have become overconfident and the and that they um, and that the inflation targets were mistaken and Mervyn King who was governor of the Bank of England up to I think 2012 and governor during the period of the financial crisis he seems to have had a change of heart um, I would I, you know, I would argue that if you're if you're going to have central bankers fixing short-term rates, you know, a necessary evil under our current monetary arrangements, then you need to have a much broader rate, a broader set of factors you look at rather than uh, the merely inflation, because uh, um, the sort of thrust of my uh, of the book's argument is that interest. That the, is that the um, impact of interest on inflation is just one of its consequences and possibly the least interesting. Fantastic. One more question, and then I want to go to Dr. Jim Walker. Um, so to what extent uh, are low rates, financial repression, to what extent are low rates responsible for or contributing to uh, our productivity problems, number one, and to what extent are they responsible for or contributing to the extraordinary wealth inequality that we see. Um, well, I think the second one I've already answered in you know the, the inflation of household of household wealth uh, obviously benefits those who have some wealth to begin with, and also those in the financial sector and and perhaps in, and in the tech sector too, who, where that the assets they manage uh, are inflated by the by the ultra low interest rates. The, with regard to productivity, um, I think one way to put this, and so, some people dis, I mean, obviously some people disagree, but um, a- Andrew Smithers, who we were talking about earlier, he, he sort of disagrees with this, uh, with my thesis that the, that the ultra low rates uh, lo- trapped capital uh, in low return businesses and therefore uh, was responsible for the zombification that I've discussed. Uh, but all, but the other aspect is is we also saw huge amount of money uh, wasted in in high tech ventures, many of which will won't um, deliver a positive return on capital. So um, I, I cite some correspondent in in the Financial Times saying that the, that Silicon Valley's unicorns were another another class of, of, of zombies, and as, as Jim Grant says. Uh, unicorns. It's a little-known fact that uni- unicorns like to graze on l- on low interest rates. The lower, the better. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so uh, Edward, we've got some. I mean, this is just. I just want to let you know you've managed to uh, draw out some of the sharpest minds um, on Twitter. Uh, next to me, my co-host Tom Thornton. We got Dr. Jim Walker, KFab, Shrub, Cantro. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, goes on and on. So my hat's off to you. So, um, Dr. Jim, uh, welcome. Uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, do you have a question for Edward? Hi, George, uh, and hi, Edward. Uh, you, you, you probably wouldn't be that surprised to to hear that uh, I'm in general agreement with just about everything you've said. Um, I, I think I've I, I'm a much nastier piece of work than you are because of your background and upbringing, and you're very kind to people. Uh, I mean, the, the fact is that these central bankers should be jailed uh, rather than uh, taught a lesson about uh, uh, how to actually read the economy like Mervyn King seems to have realised after his uh, time as a central banker. But, you know, uh, well, a couple of things I wanted to say to you, and not, not to you, but just to po- point out, epiphanies are not that unusual uh, among central bankers, because um, very recently Janet Yellen, in answer to a question about the 
the, the, the level of the yen and what America was going to do about it, because America's done quite a lot about the yen in uh, decades gone by, turned around to the questioner and said, well, you know, exchange rates are market driven. So therefore, they just have to find their own level. So my question to her would have been, if I'd been that questioner, is, so what about interest rates then? How, how come 250 PhDs in the Fed know much better than the market, uh, consisting of billions of people, what level interest rates should be? Yep. So, I mean, I, I mean that, this is just, a, a, I suppose, an observation, but I, I want to get your, your response to that, plus two other things. Um, I, I think Tim Lee's point uh, that you, you've just outlined about the, the Heinz ketchup bottle is is very uh, apposite. Uh, and I, I'm about to write a piece for a, uh, a retrospective for the Hong Kong CFA Association called Rise from Crisis, um, which of course is typical CFA because it's quite positive. Um, but they're talking about the, uh, the Asian crisis and then the financial crisis. And my point to them is going to be, I'm going to call the piece Phoenix versus Chameleon, because Asia did rise from the Asian crisis in a very specific way, learning a lot of lessons, including fiscal discipline, which is going to still stand them in good stead in the next few years. But the, the, the lessons of the, the crisis of 2008 was just chameleon. Yeah. These were people who changed their spots, or no, that's, I suppose, a leopard, but uh, changed their colour to suit the, the, the times. They, they didn't change their policies, they didn't change their attitude, they didn't change their approach. You know, Janet Yellen, when I heard her in Hong Kong in 2010, after they'd solved the problem, was asked by somebody, but what if it actually really doesn't work in the next two years? Um, what if plan A doesn't work and you have to go to plan B? What, what, what do you say to that? She said, more of plan A. Yeah, there you are. Um, and finally, I just want to make one last point, and that's again about uh, central bankers. Because what, what we, we uh, and, and you obviously realise with this book, by the way, I've, I've now got two copies of it, Edward. I was so excited when John sent me the, uh, the notification of this call. I managed to order it twice. So uh, I, I'll sign one of them for somebody if uh, anybody wants one. But uh, uh, I notice my name doesn't appear in the index, which uh, given that you've got Hayek and uh, Mises and Bomberwerk in there, I don't suppose I feel too badly about. <laughs> but, you know, what, what this all amounts to is institutionalised theft from ordinary people. The, 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 the elevation of people who borrow above people who save yeah, And for the life of me, I can't get over that and I can't get round it. And it just leaves me so sad and upset. Uh, um, that... Yeah, now let me, let me um, interrupt you there, Jim. Well, first yeah. of all, it's good to hear your voice after a while. And secondly, I'll tell you, George, so when I was at GMO in, in 2008, I was trying to persuade Jeremy Grantham that, that the emerging markets were get, you know, weren't going to decouple from the... Um, from 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 what was going on in the ad advanced economies, and I wasn't making any headway. And then Jim uh, came in; he was working at CLSA at the time, and um, and I dragged Jeremy along to the meeting. And Jeremy sort of sat there rather ashen faced while he was listening to Jim, sort of sounding like a sort of Presbyterian, a sort of nineteenth century Scottish Presbyterian minister. And it, Jeremy walked out of the room and sold five billion dollars worth of of emerging market equities that asset allocation was sitting on. And within three months, those equities had dropped in half, whereupon Jeremy bought them back again. So, uh, Ger so um, Jim performed a very useful function, <laughs> persuasive function uh, at, at my old shop. Um, with what you say with regards to savings and, and the imbalance between reward for sa for savers and reward for borrowers, I think is the nub of the, what, yeah, it's sort of, to some extent, the nub of the problem. Uh, there is a, you'll be aware, there was a you know, 19th century definition of interest um, uh, by an early English economist, Nassau Senior, uh, who defined interest as a reward for abstinence. And um, what I argue, I think, Jim, you'll probably be sympathetic, 
is that despite all this talk of the global savings flood uh, of, of the last couple of decades, the reality for much of the Western world has been uh, very lackluster savings uh, on the household side. Um, and uh, that is, uh, I see to a large extent, uh, a function of there being very, very little incentive to save and a much greater incentive to borrow. And that creates the, um, you know, this intertemporal disequilibrium uh, that, you know, the Austrian economists who you're beloved of uh, wrote about uh, at great length. Um, as for Janet Yellen, I, I, I agree with you that it, it sent, no, no committee should be in charge of setting the what Jim Grant, back to Jim again, calls the universal price, uh, the, 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 the most important price in the capitalist system. Uh, if they're going to do it, uh, as I say, they better have pretty broad reference, not this narrow inflation focus. Uh, there is, I mean, you're probably aware of my friend Thomas Meyer, who used to be the uh, chief economist at Deutsche Bank. Thomas has come out with the idea uh, that a, you know, that a, uh, you probably won't like this, that the central bank digital currencies could, in effect, if they were sort of, const if they were constituted to only grow at a particularly limited level, they could sort of replace the fiat currency system uh, we live under and that then interest rates would be more market uh, oriented or market driven. And, and I think this is, you know, this the failure of interest rates, the key price in the capitalist system to be market oriented. And, and when we talk about market, what we mean is drawing information from an infinite variety of sources. Uh, the fact that that market doesn't operate, the key price doesn't operate, uh, leads to really an endless series of problems. Yeah, no, 100%, um, Edward. And I, I didn't realise that about uh, your friend and the, uh, the commentary on d digital currencies. I, I, I've, I'm ambivalent towards them, I must admit. It just sounds to me as if what he's saying is control the growth of money supply. Well, and well you can... no, but Jim, they could be, as you know, Hayek wrote... Um, but well, you get the yep. right title, the, you know, the book on on comp on private Compe money. Co competing currencies. Yep, competing yep. currencies. So you, you could envisage, I mean, there'd be hu there are a huge number of vested interests that would prevent it from happening. But you could yep. envisage a world in which a sort of a non-Ponzi scheme cryptocurrency <laughs> or yep. a... Yep. Or wait, a, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Or a <laughs> oxymoron, sorry. <laughs> or a or a C or a CBDC issued by a sort of responsible central bank, second oxymoron. Uh, <laughs> what, what... <laughs> but you, you, you know that that Hayek's book on competing currencies was based entirely on private banks producing the. Uh, the competing currencies, uh, Edward, rather than central banks. Yeah, no, I'm aware of that. I yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm uh, I, I'm sympathetic to his position, but I, I'm unfortunately have a feeling that Dr. it's Jim, hey, Dr. Jim, an I think old you, one. Hey, Dr. Jim, I think you and Edward got to get a room together. This is getting <laughs> <laughs> all right. So hold on, so hold on, hold on. Edward only has a few more minutes. I want to get a couple other folks in here. So let's do K Fab and then Michael. Welcome, K Fab. What's up, my friend? Please unmute yourself, K Fab. Thanks, George. Hi, Edward. Um, my my question, comment and question relates to um, the impact of, you know, I, I started this count about a little less than a year ago to highlight the impact of delusion versus reality. And um, I know a lot of your work centers around interest rate history. What, what, what are your thoughts about um, the launch in the late 90s of really creating, as I like to joke, phony baloney inflation? So we're price fixing interest rates, which I think I, I agree with you and Jim. That's inherently a bad idea. But now we've been price price fixing for over 20 years using a made up inter, uh, uh, inflation rate that was specifically engineered to you know reduce long term entitlement liabilities. So it's almost like we've in institutionalized the phony Fisher equation in pricing risk and assets all across the capital structure. So I, I just W w wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, what is inflation and and how real rates have been impacted by the, these huge shifts. Well, the um, the consumer price index 
as a sort of measure of inflation, it has all, it's not just you know, a question of 20, 20 odd years that you mentioned. It's always been a contentious question to some, whether, um, and particularly again, the, the, the Austrian economists, and particularly Oscar Mer Morgenstern, who, who was, uh, I think he ended, I can't remember, he, he ended up at one of the US universities. I'm not sure whether it was Harvard or, or where else. But it, he, he wrote that, you know, an attempt to create a consumer, a consumer price index is, is, a, is an heroic assumption and then you throw in in the modern world all these, and it's not. My, I haven't been looking at it recently, but you throw in all these hedonic adjustments and so forth. I understand, for instance, you know, popular Ford truck, uh, you know, costs you know today the same truck costs you know, twice, two and a half times as much as it did in 1990. But uh, once you put in the you know, is it the BLS hedonic adjustments? It's only gone up in price by 15 percent, sort of absurd you can't buy the same truck for 15 percent more um and so so i think yes i think i in get i i do i discuss this in the in the sort of general problems of pursuing an inflation target that you don't even you know you don't even know it's impossible to exactly to say what inflation is and to measure it accurately even if you wanted to do so thanks very much uh, Michael, um, please unmute yourself. Do you have a question for Jim? Maybe for, 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 for Edward? Michael, are you there? Not sure if he's there. Yeah, hello, George. Can you hear I, me? Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Michael. We can hear you. Yep. Yeah, hello, George. Thanks. This is awesome. And uh, thank you, George, for the space. And uh, uh, I thank the speaker for the information. Uh, I disagree that uh, the Fed is the cause of inequality, but uh, this is a minor point. Uh, we have this zombification, I agree, and uh, the low rates and, uh, and the boom and bust cycles. And I want to ask this uh, highly qualified uh, individual, Edward, what is the alternative? I mean... Through the boom and bust, we get something that works at the end. I mean, in the dot-com, many companies died, but uh, something was left. And uh, we use now, actually, the technology we use now was so developed in the 90s. What is the alternative? I, I, I listen to hundreds of people that are... Uh, put the, you know, blame on the system, but, and I believe them. You know, I have no reason to disagree, but what is the alternative? Thanks um, a lot, George. I, I appreciate. Uh, well, my, I mean, that's a good point. Um, I, I'm not actually against the boom-bust cycle uh, in itself. In the 19th century, uh, there was a long period of, of, of very strong booms and busts, and, and the French economist Clément Ugla said that the made a, he was famous for the so-called Ugla cycle, the ten-year cycle. Said that the the strength of an economy was was reflected by the severity of its bus. And there is a, what I argue in the book is that our problem uh, is that we didn't really allow the bust to take place after two thousand eight. But go back to we trapped capital. In, um, in, in, in uses where it should have been reallocated. So, um, you know, I, I, it's, I, it's very unpopular, uh, this, this the so-called liquidationist thesis um, that um, you know, Andrew Mellon, who's U.S. Treasury Secretary at the time of the Great Depression, uh, apparently said to President Hoover, liquidate, I can't remember, liquidate capital, liquidate farmers, uh, liquidate businesses people will lead better and more moral lives and and that that hoover um mellon's comment has been sort of held up to ridicule ever since but in fact there is this notion of that the that the bust the, there's something called the the pit stop theory of recession uh a pit stop being like you know a, a, a car race where you go into the pit stop take a little break and change your tires and i don't know your 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 brake discs 
and you come out going all the mu- you know, and come out traveling faster. The trouble we've had uh, with these successive interventions is that you we have had slower and slower growth. So sort of by avoiding the pit stop, the car just is sort of limping round the the the, uh, the circuit and sort of grinding to a halt. Um, and so I think that it's not sort of the it may be that a sort of boom bust is is an inevitable function of uh, of of a capitalist or even of a sort of human system as it is in in various other in various other natural systems it, and it's the boom bust is not in itself uh, an evil it's this intervention with a process which which results in both slower growth and and these in this incredible financial disequilibria and you know and frankly you know there's no way we're going with you know excessive debt and uh, inadequate savings and uh, profound pension problems these are these are pro- these are issues that you know that that we we're going to have to live with and resolve over the decades to come and 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 there's no way any of us even if, however prudently any of you behave, there's no way that any of us can avoid sort of paying the price because it's one that society will have to pay. Ed, we're listening to you speak. It kind of reminds me of uh, our mutual friend Jim Grant, uh, the book he wrote in the 90s, Trouble with Prosperity. And as I recall, the point he was making was, you know, he's talking about the Japanese uh, bubble and what followed. And by underwriting the downside and by not allowing for the liquidationists to take over, as you refer to it, by not allowing the market to clear. Um, yes, it underwrote, uh, the down, it underwrote the downside, so it prevented the bottom from entirely falling out, but it also capped the upside because um, it didn't allow for the sort of, you know, Schumpeterian creative destruction process to, uh, yeah. and to get it on. And it was in, in Japan that we first saw the corporate zombie phenomenon, and after 1990, you saw you know, Japan's uh, financial returns took a, a step downwards. Um, in fact, actually, Japanese productivity per capita didn't do too, too badly. And the Japanese, um, in many ways today, and it's not really subject for, I've got to go in a second, but yep. in a way, the Japanese, because, you know, because they sort of still stick to their manufacturing and their engineering and still train proper engineers rather than financial engineers, they're probably uh, in a much better place going forward uh, than much of the Western 100%, world. Hundred percent. We'll have one more question, Edward, and then we'll we'll send you on your way. So, um, Howard, um, my good friend Howard, uh, please unmute yourself. The floor is yours, Howard. Good morning, George. Thanks so much for doing this, Edward. This is an absolute treat. Um, in going back through the uh, devil make uh, devil take the hindmost, I was taken with all of the debt crisis crises we've had over the now centuries, being somewhat like different versions of the uh, bonds that were issued on the non-existent nation of Poyai that were sold uh, on the London Stock Exchange. But that the the problem now is that sometimes we can't get rid of this stuff. We, the the markets don't clear and we end up making uh, through our definitions and the, the ways that we brand these things in a way, I'll call it the way that we talk about them, ending up having to continue to carry them and we can't get rid of the nation of Poyai problems and problem and it seems to keep cropping up and we clear some of the debt but we never get rid of the underlying problem of having some of that stuff linger around you know, I'm just I wondering I, I'm I, wondering I if that's good shorthand for, for well, the I think work that, that is. you've I mean, done I think what we you know what p- people refer to the debt super cycle and the debt super cycle is is that to avoid every you know whenever there is a bust you lower interest rates and you recover in the near term, but at the price of not clearing the bad debt from the previous cycle and adding a whole load of more future bad debt into the system. And uh, the question is, are we at the end of the debt super cycle? And um, you, one can call this wrong, uh, but I think that if we're at the end of a 40-year um, bull market in bonds, uh, then where, where more debt can be accrued uh, at ever lower interest rates. If we're at the end of that period, then, um, then that 
then we have to, you know, that that we can't continue to accrue or to avoid the bad debts. What I'm, I'm, I sort of buy into the thesis of my friend Russell Napier, used to work with Jim Walker at CLSA, which is that, you know, what we have going forward is a period of financial repression in which interest rates will rise, uh, but they won't rise as much as inflation. And you would see that this year where the gap between uh, between trailing inflation and the Fed funds rate is probably close to a record level, perhaps more than a record level, so that that gap is will burn off the debt over a period of time going forward. And, and you know, the, the financial repression uh, in the post-war period uh, was used to pay off the government debts uh, built up during the Second World War. And I think the you know, financial repression going forward uh, will pay down some of these excessive debts that we've built up over the last cycle. OK, with that, uh, George, I, I, cause Edward, I have an appointment. Yeah, I'm Edward, I've, Edward. I've enjoyed the ch chat and you have a nice, uh, a nice quality of, uh, of listener, let's say, uh, with interesting questions. And, um, and so, um, great. Thanks a lot. No, it, it, it was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. And maybe, uh, you know, consider coming back in the future. This was most, most illuminating and I hope most will, uh, Go buy your book. This has been fantastic. Uh, thank you, Edward. We'll be in touch. We're going to keep the room going for another five or ten minutes. But Edward, uh, good day, and uh, okay. talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye right? then. Bye. Okay, great. Okay, so let's move on to uh, Gnostic. Uh, Gnostic, you're up. Floor is yours. Uh, I just wanted to ask Edward. Uh, in his book, he covered uh, the Japanese housing uh, issues and how that how he thought that compared to what was going on today, but. Uh, because it was one of the only places that I had seen that covered. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, we, 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 he, we was, he was sorry. We ran out of time there. Um, I should know the answer to that question. Cause I've been following the Japanese market for 40 years, but I need to get some more caffeine. Um, I'll happily take you on with that question in another one of our spaces. Um, I'm just, I need some more caffeine. So great question. Uh, we'll revisit that in another room. Uh, let's go to Jonathan. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Hi, Jonathan. Hi there, George. Uh, fabulous space. And um, if Edward's still listening, you know, uh, I just finished like you reading his book and uh, it's up there with Bernstein's Against the Gods for me. I mean, it's it's spot on and it, it just really was a pleasure to listen to him speak and articulate his points in a very elegant way. Um, the, o the only question I had was one really to Edward himself, which was, you know, how did he feel um, low interest rates and monetary easing? Um, and the impact that has on on lowering opportunity costs have increased the risk profile, you know, as investors search for higher yield in riskier um, assets, which very much goes to underpin the the everything bubble, but in particular the tech bubble that we're we're beginning to see certainly at the Series A, Series uh, B stage, um, you know, imploding. Um, and I mean, if we if we look at the likes of Tiger Global, you can see that happening now. Um, but uh, but he's gone. So I, I guess if anybody else can answer that, then. Um... Yeah. Well, 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 Jonathan, I'm going to treat your uh, question rather as a statement. Um, I couldn't have said it any better myself. I think I've said it in so many uh, words uh, in other rooms. I actually and, and, and listening to to, to Edward speak. Um, speaking about the need for organized liquidation and whatnot, as many have heard me rant in these rooms, I actually uh, view, you know, the destruction of some of these moribund zombie companies or uh, cash incinerating uh, unicorns um, that don't scale. I, I actually view the liquidation of those as the bankruptcy of those things as a good thing, as a good thing, um, because it will go some way towards reorienting capital flows from unproductive assets to more productive assets. So I'm quite with you. And I believe uh, Edward is singing from the same prayer book. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the only point that um, I took from, from uh, you know, the, the um, last part of the conversation was uh, he sees government using sort of inflation as a way to inflate away debt. Um, and obviously that comes with the economic consequences, so hardships. Um, and, and, and that obviously is, is very depressing. 100%, Jonathan. I mean, 
the numbers don't add up, as you rightly point out. And so, you know, politicians always like to cheat, if you will. Um, the debt has to be serviced. It'll either, it either gets defaulted on, which is not really, you know, you can't have in a proper uh, functioning uh, capitalist system, or it gets inflated away. And so uh, inflate away is what they will do. And now, Dr. Jim, I'm sure, has a more uh, precise and better answer. Dr. Jim, please unmute. Yeah, yeah no, no, not a more precise or better answer, uh, George, but just a, a, an observation that, yes, inflation actually, um, generalized inflation can get rid of debt. The Japanese did it. Uh, in 1947, 48, they had a over 200% debt to GDP ratio at that time. Uh, their inflation rate went through the roof. They impoverished just about the whole society, um, and uh, they, they got rid of the, the the debt. But the only actual thing that gets rid of debt, given the evidence of history, is default. And default comes through recession, and it comes through. The, the, the wipeout period that I think you and I, and I'm quite sure uh, Edward would kind of believe in where bad companies go bust. You know, he, here's a big joke at the moment um, that everybody hates China, I know, but uh, the, the Chinese have got a campaign going on just now with property developers who are amongst the most corrupt companies in their system. Um, they've uh, taken on massive amounts of debt and the Chinese government's letting them go bust. You know, I've got to say to you, I don't actually know who's the capitalist anymore, whether it's America or China, because uh, given the way that the, they're operating their systems, um, the, the Federal Reserve certainly isn't capitalist, and it's certainly not trying to clean out the system, but the Chinese are. So, you know, it leaves Austrians like me in a very, very, very hard place, given the politics of China, uh, about which system is working well. But default is the only way out of debt. Yeah, Jim, 100%, 100%. By the way, uh, maybe you could, uh, and I'm not going to pose the question uh, properly, and I don't know if you heard it, but Gnostic, the previous uh, questioner, had a question about Japanese housing. And Jim, I'm sure you, and Gnostic, if you're still there, maybe Gnostic, you could unmute yourself and rephrase the question towards Dr. Jim, because he has been you know, the number one rated Asian economist for decades, and I'm sure he could give a good answer to your question. So, Gnostic, if you could rephrase the question for Dr. Jim, that'd be great. Hi, Dr. Jim. Uh, nice to meet you. My One of my main questions and one of the things that is affecting real estate in a big way is the fact that the government doesn't seem to feel that interfering with the natural market forces in housing uh, is an issue. And the Japanese did it several times back in the 1980s, I believe, in 1990s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. I'm been a while since I read Devil Take the Hindmost. Um, but in that book, that was the only place I'd seen it discussed before. I would love to find someplace else that discusses it because it's simply not in the discussion right now. But what they did by interfering with speculation and housing and taxing profits for the whole thing is essentially, from my understanding, people stopped selling housing and the price of housing went through the roof, the exact opposite of what they wanted to do. Um, could you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's true for the, the, the early run-up, or not the early run-up, the run-up to the final stages of the bubble uh, in Japan, where um, the, I, I mean, there were a whole host of factors in there from currency to interest rates to um, euphoria about supposedly a new model in the global system that seemed to be working better than any other model. Uh, I remember having this uh, conversation with my, my boss at the Royal Bank of Scotland way back in the 1980s that uh, he, he thought the Germans and the Japanese were uh, way, way ahead of everybody else in terms of their economic model. And I felt that the, uh, the American model at that time, which was a very different model from now, um, w w was, w was, was going to win. But, um, I mean, here's the, the, the problem after the bubble, as it were, because what happened with the Japanese, and this is what's happening with the global system, and if Edward was still here, he would uh, immediately start thinking in terms of the zombie companies. But the, the, the Japanese, in order to try and protect the bubble that they had created, not so much protect the bubble, but protect the people who would be the fallout from the bubble, in other words, the banking system, 
essentially allowed zombie companies in the construction sector, in the property development sector, uh, in almost every sector related to property, to continue in existence as they lowered interest rates towards zero and protected the banks. Now, one of the interesting things of the, the 1990s was that if you go back to that period where Japanese growth was very poor, where the, the bubble economy was um, uh, had, was busting, the interesting thing was that no Japanese banks went bust at that time. The only thing that caused Japanese banks to go bust was the Asian crisis, because what these guys did in response to the problems in Japan was begin to lend like crazy in Hong Kong, in Southeast Asia, in Singapore, uh, and elsewhere in Asia, in what they thought were people that were following effectively the Japanese model. And when they went bust, and they really did go bust, they were the uh, the, the archetypal um, Austrian bust. Uh, when they went bust, the Japanese banks had to recapitalize, consolidate, um, and reinvent themselves. So the, the, there was this uh, very strange, um, now I think universal almost uh, epidemic of supporting bad companies and allowing the banking system to continue in existence but only a kind of semi-existence, not a vibrant existence that had existed for uh, the, 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 the usual history of, uh, of capitalism. Um, and I, I'm afraid that I think we've backed ourselves into the corner of the Japanese banks. As Edward said at the time, or it was when he was still on, um, zombie companies were invented in Japan. Now we've all got them. And the, the one message from Austrian economics is that the bust phase of the cycle is the recovery phase because that gets rid of the bad companies, it gets rid of the zombies, and it clears the system out. And if you don't do that, then you, you lock yourself in to very, very low rates of growth uh, and a very poor return economy, unless, of course, you've got a central bank that just prints money hand over fist. Thanks, Jim. That's terrific. All right, we're going to take two more questions, and then we're going to close the room. I know you guys are shocked this room is going to be under now in 20 minutes. So I want to go first to uh, my friend Mark Newman, and then we're going to go to my friend Philip. Mark, floor is yours. Hey, George, thank you. Jim, fantastically interesting stuff. And I want to just you, – you really made a little light bulb go off in my head. So uh, I don't know – we don't know each other, but I spent my first uh, – decade of my life almost in Japan in the business. That's how I met George. Anyway, you made a really interesting comment there about China versus other parts and which is capitalist and which is not. I think that one of the things within the cycle now that we're seeing and we've seen and we saw in Japan, right? They don't let a lot of companies go down, right? They don't let them go to, they're just zombie companies. And I think that part of that stems from the sort of jet debt to GDP levels, because all of a sudden, if all the little soldiers go down, then the army, the sovereign army, is all of a sudden has credit issues. I remember back in the day when Japan was questioned about downgrading their rating, everyone was like, what happens to all the companies? Well, obviously, the sovereign rating is the highest, and then the companies are below that. And so you make a real interesting point about China, because on some level, China's bonds and debt and debt situation is a little bit more... Uh, extra outs let's call it outside the realm of sort of what we considered normal traditional finance up until recently i guess and so i wondered your view on you know look at the airlines in this country for example never going bankrupt and sort of that's why sort of prices remain high and never come down because it's always government rescue and i wondered your thoughts a little bit further <laughs> china but let's talk japan and the u.s right and their inability to let these companies go down for the count. And you mentioned the sort of default issue, like we had negative rates and stuff like that, and Japan has negative rates. That's sort of like a quasi default in and of itself. So I wondered within that context, and I love the capitalist communist question that you raised, where do you see this going based on sort of untenable interest rates going forward here? Uh, gosh, that, that that's... Um... An exceptionally good question, Mark. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the saddest thing for me is that 
it's only really in the last 20 odd years that America has gone down this rabbit hole. I mean, Mer America really was the uh, the beacon of light in the global economy in terms of market economics and in terms of uh, allowing, uh, and, and to a certain extent, it embedded this in the IMF uh, over the course of the, the last 50 years. Of course, that's completely changed since, Chris, since Christine Lagarde got her hands on it. But that, uh, you, you know, you, you had to teach bad uh, actors a lesson when they, they, they got out of hand. And that, that lesson was really all about um, allowing bad institutions to fail, allowing bad companies to fail, uh, and replacing it with discipline. Uh, discipline in the financial sense, discipline in the fiscal sense, discipline in the monetary sense. And, I, you know, I, 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 I completely take your point. And I was not being entirely facetious when I was saying I don't know who, who's more capitalist, the, the U.S. economy now or the Chinese economy. The Chinese economy certainly isn't capitalist. And it, it follows those Japanese traits of protecting its own uh, and including the, the U.S. airlines, et cetera, et cetera, uh, much more than it should do. But the, the, the fact is that at the moment, if you look at interest rate structures in uh, in China relative to elsewhere in the world, they have never got anywhere close to zero interest rates. Uh, in fact, if anything, uh, over the course of the last 20 years, when you, you begin to look at real interest rates in terms of lending rates in the economy, they, they've begun to impose a discipline on new companies and new actors in the system that means that they have to make money, they have to have a return on invest in, investment that makes sense. Now, whether they can uh, salvage the whole system that they built up over the last 70 years uh, and and go from that system to a, a more capitalist system, I, I've got real severe doubts. But uh, at least they're heading in the right direction and they haven't made some absolutely basic mistakes as far as I can see. Would, would, would you say that low interest rates encourage moral hazard? I mean, that's uh, uh, I was trying to get that with with, with Edward, um, I wanted to get his his opinion, his sort of you know, knowledgeable view. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, John, yeah Jonathan, I, I, I think we've covered that, and I don't mean to be rude. I just want to get everyone's questions, and I need to close the room. So um, let's go to Philip and then Gnostic for the last word. Philip, please unmute yourself. Hey, George. Uh, thanks very much. Great space. Um, if you guys address this already, you know, I'll go back and listen. I, I had to take another call. Um, midway through um, Edward's comments. But, you know, I, I guess a couple of things I was thinking about when, when Edward was talking and, and, and Jim. Um, so there's a, a Chinese uh, geopolitical, you know, analyst who made a comment recently in, a, um, in an interview where he talked about the fact that the difference between China and the U.S. is that China would never allow their capitalists, right, Jack Ma, et cetera, to uh, capture the Politburo. Whereas in the United States, we clearly have a system that is broken on so many levels because um, of special interests and, you know, all the power money, right? So that, that's why we saw Jack Ma sort of, you know, the, the Ant Financial IPO got crushed, right? And so... When, when I think about that analogy between the two systems and, you know, the pros and cons of each, what, what frustrates me relative to this whole interest rate discussion and inflation deflation is the fact that, and, and this goes, Jim, to your point, right? How do you get rid of the debt when jet debt to GDP, at least government debt to GDP is 127, 130%, total debt to GDP is approaching 300%. How do you get rid of that government debt, right? Well, it's either your default, and we all know the U.S. isn't going to default, but you can do a soft default via, you know, inflation. And so when you think about the geopolitical backdrop and the fact that our, uh, our government is captured, right, 100%, well, Munger says all the time, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. So someone needs to tell me, like, what's your opinion on the fact that we're going to see higher inflation for longer, right? 
So it's not going to be 9.1%, but 8%, 6%. So over a number of years. Yeah, Philip, yeah, yeah, fill fill up, fill up, you're interested in time. Um, I don't know how long you've been in it, but we did cover this earlier. Is there a specific question that you want to raise for Dr. Walker? Otherwise, I'd like to move on. Oh, my, my question is, what, what do you think the probability is that we do see higher uh, inflation for longer, higher interest rates for longer? Because that grows the system nominally. And it, it preserves the, the Ponzi scheme for, you know, another decade or more. Dr. Jim? Yeah, yeah I, I, good question, Philip. Um, I mean, the, the one thing that uh, inflation has against it is that uh, it benefits very few people, whereas it disbenefits the masses. And as far as I can remember at the moment in America, the masses still get a vote. Um, and the very few people that benefit from the inflation, they also get a vote, but uh, it really doesn't count. When inflation's 2%, that doesn't matter, uh, although I think it does matter, but uh, it apparently doesn't matter. When inflation's 4%, it matters. When it's 6%, it matters a lot. And if it goes above 6%, it's catastrophic for these guys. So this is now a political issue in America. And the political issue is that uh, unless they can bring the inflation rate down, there's going to be a revolution, not a revolution, but a, a revolution in voting. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That never benefits the, uh, the incumbent party. Yeah, Dr. Jim, before we go to the final question from Gnostic, I had one question I want to ask you, a point that you made a few months ago, uh, which has been burned in my brain. Um, you were talking about um, you know, the ex-post and the ex-ante economy and how when inflation is allowed to run wild, Companies have no idea if they're making money, losing money. Um, many of them have some sharp uh, listeners here in the room who have some really good insights about companies grabbing price. But, for instance, uh, Jackson, uh, who's in the room, uh, has spoken about, you know, hotels jacking up prices like crazy. But they're still they're not even sure they're making any money just because costs are going up so much. So could you just update us on your views about um you know, what's happening to profits, profits maybe in real terms. And, and, and if inflation isn't brought under control, like capitalism, I mean, you're just going <laughs> to, capital doesn't work. So maybe just weigh in on that, please. Yeah, no, I, I think you've summarized it really well, George, that uh, the, the fact is that we're still in the very early stages of cost uh, inflation and the reaction to cost inflation. And I mean, going back to Philip's point, and it's one of the key elements here that, you know, let, let's say we've got 8% inflation this year um, and 3% wage increases. Well, that means that people are 5% worse off. So next year, they're not going to go for 3% wage increases. They're going to go for 5 In actual fact, they're going to go for more than that. And whether companies like it or not, people are going to have a big, hard time with the fact that their actual cost of living has increased and their real wages have decreased. So... What we think at the moment as a, as a profitable company, I don't think you should take that for granted. And it's going back to that ex post ex ante thing that when you, you, you create the inflation in the system, um, all that happens is that it reverberates around the system for a long, long time. You know, commodity price increases can go to zero. Commodity prices are an absolute fraction of the cost of any services or any manufacturers faced in America. The thing that really matters is whether or not people are happy with their, their wages and with the, the ability to pay the prices that are, uh, they're facing every day in the shops. And they're not at the moment. They're certainly not in the UK. They're certainly not in America. That means that cost inflation is going up in the US, not down. And it means that profits are going to be squeezed. And that's really bad news for the economy. Yeah, I mean, Jim, it just strikes me, we're looking at a profits really dire profits outlook and part of the, the, the implicit in that is you know your comments or your thoughts on the unit labor cost data and the productivity numbers that we've seen yeah I mean, but you, you know george nobody pays any attention to profits these days i mean i i, I think that the whole system would be very very well served if we stopped producing gdp numbers totally meaningless if we stop producing lots of the statistics that People are looking at every supposed month and every uh, quarter, totally meaningless. All we need to know is whether companies are making money, whether they can afford to employ people, and whether or not they can afford to invest. 
And that's all that matters to the economy. But we're concentrated in so much crap, it's unbelievable. 100%. Gnostic, you got the last word. Dr. Jim, please come back. Um, between you and Edward, this has been one of the most edifying sessions, pardon the pun, uh, that I've had in a long time. Um, and I have so many more questions, but let me close on this question. Do you think the capital destruction in China will actually succeed in restabilizing the, Ch the Japanese or the Chinese, pardon me. Do you think that capital destruction in China will succeed in restabilizing the Chinese currency to such a point that it can enter the world as a reserve currency? Yeah, that's a very good uh, question, Nostic. But, um, the, 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 the Chinese are in a, a, a real policy war amongst themselves just now. Not that anybody is on uh, the, the, the wrong or the right side here. I think they're, they're all on the same side. They have this zero COVID policy in place, which they're not going to give up anytime soon. They also have an idea that they want to stimulate the economy and stabilise uh, economic growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. My view is the two are mutually exclusive, not mutually dependent. They, they, they can't exist together. And with that, then, I think there's all sorts of um, other parts of the, the system that are not so much crumbling just now, but certainly um, wavering, including capital flows and including um, confidence in the currency. Uh, and this is a, I, I don't know what the answer is to this question. I don't know what the Chinese are going to do, except that the, the one very good contact that I've got in China said there's nobody in the leadership that would back away from the zero COVID policy just now. So it doesn't matter whether it's Xi Jinping or anybody else. But I just see that the policies that, that they have for stimulation and for zero COVID are likely to be in extreme conflict just now. So expect a Chinese, our forecast for Chinese growth for this year is 2%. Uh, everybody in Asia that I mentioned that to, A, laughs at me and B says, well, if that's the case, then we are heading towards negative GDP. That's where we're going. Thanks. Thanks for that, Gnostic. Thanks for that, Jim. Guys, this has been an unbelievable run. Um, I mean, Jim, I want to thank you. You really, uh, the one-two punch um, has been phenomenal. Uh, we have to do another room with you, Jim, as a key speaker. Um, so we'll, we'll arrange that. This has been awesome. I want to thank all of you. Real treat to have Edward with us. Um, our next room, another great room. These things keep getting better and better. We have Fed Guy 12 uh, speaking, I think it's next Tuesday at 11 a.m., if I'm not mistaken. So, again, we have the best convos, period, on Twitter. Smartest audience, best speakers, best content, and I think pretty good moderation. Um, so, with that, I want to thank each and every one of you. This has been awesome. And um, stay safe. Be well. Take care. Bye-bye.